I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Again, I'm just so thankful for those videos and the testimonies each week we've had. There's something about hearing the story of Jesus told by someone when it's fresh to them, that it feels fresh to you. And that's what I, one of the things I love about how well those are done. As Scott was mentioning on the video, we can pray to the Lord and ask him to speak to us and through us. And so let's do that one more time now. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we pause here before opening your word, we would ask that we would be in a posture of standing underneath it to let your word speak over us and in us and through us, not not, not above it, not, not that we would be the judge, but Lord, that you would critique us and shape us and conform us to the image of your son, Jesus, the faithful witness. Lord, and as we press into this ninth commandment, Lord, would you Again, just make us more like your son, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, each of the commandments as we've been going through them, for lack of a better word or phrase, has come with a little bit of a hang-up. And I don't mean that the commandment is bad per se, but that as we look at a certain commandment from our time and place in history, Something at first might not be clear to us. So with the second commandment, we talked about and might have got hung up on on, on how is the second commandment about not having idols different than the first commandment about having no other gods before the real God. And so we talked about that. With the fourth commandment, we might get hung up about how aspects of the Sabbath are applicable today or not applicable today. With the sixth commandment about murder, we might not necessarily get hung up, so to speak, but we might wonder what there is to preach about because everybody believes murder is wrong. The hang-up we might bring to the ninth commandment, I suspect, is believing that lying's not really all that big of a deal. I remember when I worked in construction uh, before I was a pastor and there was this project manager named Joe, and Joe worked for a general contractor, and Joe was notorious for lying about everything. Joe lied about everything. And I remember going to this meeting with Joe um, off-site, on the job site, and out of our office with him, and then I come back to our office, and our superintendent asked me questions about this meeting with Joe and when we need to be on site and whatnot. And the superintendent asked me, uh, but how do you know if Joe is lying to you? I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. And he says, well, are his lips moving? (laughs) Let me know where this is going. And I say, yeah. He said, well, he was lying to you. (laughs) And we laughed about it, right? It it was a joke. um, And we took precautions accordingly to document our work and whatnot. We just, it wasn't that big of a deal in a strange way, even though it was a big deal. It just, it, it was okay. We knew how things went. We don't often feel like lying is a big deal. Consider the online forms that ask you to check the box that you've read, right, and agree. You've never done that. Like, you have never done that. And you've all checked, I read and agree. No one's read those. I don't even know who wrote them, has read them. They just put them out there. When we preached about adultery, um, we talked about euphemisms of cheating or affair, the nicer sounding words than the reality, but when it comes to lying, the euphemisms abound. You might tell a fib or a whopper, tall tale, a white lie, a half-truth. You can spin a yarn. You can pull a fast one, pull someone's leg, pull the wool over someone's eyes. You might equivocate or even bamboozle, another word you could use. We might spread fake news. We might falsify figures, distort facts, be given to exaggeration, the fish was this big. Notice as a fisherman, it was this big. Right, when you walk into the Bass Pro Shop on Paxton, do you, do you know what it says above? 
Some of you know, I'm like this. Welcome, fishermen, hunters, and other liars. <laughs> That's what it says when you walk into the building. And I could share other euphemisms for lying, but they seem less appropriate to share from the pulpit. But even if we can see in this list, it adds up to make us feel like lying's not that big of a deal, but it is a big deal. If you're holding a Bible, please turn with me to the book of Exodus. Exodus is the second book in the Bible. If you're going to use one of the ones that, like I'm holding here in the pews, it's on page 57. We've been teaching through Exodus in the fall, and as we hit the Ten Commandments, we've slowed down and we're going one commandment a week. Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, we come to the ninth commandment, which says, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You'll notice that it doesn't say you shall not lie. That's often how we understand it, but rather, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The commandment certainly has something to say about all lying and telling a fib and tall tales, but the wording of the commandment indicates a specific type of lying, lying as a witness in a court case, which is a big deal. If you have a Bible, just flip over just a page in the one I'm holding to Exodus chapter 23, the first three verses. Then the, the following chapters, the next few chapters after the Ten Commandments, kind of fill out some of the situations in which these Ten Commandments might apply for Israel and perhaps in some ways for us. But in Exodus chapter 23, we read, first three verses, You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit, siding with the many, so as to pervert justice. Nor, and mark this, shall you be partial to the poor man, in his lawsuit. So, so not with a wicked person, not with the many, not with the poor. You be impartial. Here again, we see the stress of the importance on the truthfulness of a witness in court. I remember the first time, or one time I should say, I had to testify in court as a pastor. And for whatever reason, the lawyer did not prepare me very well for this event. It made it seem like no big deal. I'd just say a few things on behalf of of the defendant, only those aspects of his life that I knew something about. It's no big deal. And I remember my name getting called, and I, I walk up to the wooden box, and, and the woman says to me, you know, raise your right hand, and do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And I did. And, and, and I remember, though, and I know it feels like a cliche, but my knees started to buckle, and I started to get lightheaded. I speak in front, I'm speaking in front of you now. Like, I've I don't love speaking in front of people, but I've gotten used to it. And yet, in that moment, I just was overwhelmed. And I wasn't even going to lie. I'm glad, I hope you, you know, hope you know that's true. But I wasn't even going to lie. And I just felt the weight of what it means in a court of law to speak the truth. And if that's true in our day, it was especially true back in ancient times, where the witness was everything. Today, we might have video footage. DNA samples, cell phone records, and other kinds of evidence to put forth. But back in the day, the word of a witness was everything. Think of the dignity. Think of the dignity that God intended to give Israel this new nation in this commandment. God's people were coming from a context, as the preface to the Ten Commandments says, and we've said several times, where they were coming out of the house of slavery, Exodus 20, verse 2. They had been slaves in Egypt where they had no legal power. If you were stronger and you were in charge, well, you just did what you wanted. As slaves, they had no legal protection. And here, in commanding witnesses in court to be truthful, God was giving to Israel a society that valued what God valued. God was giving Israel courtrooms that were fair and just. God was giving dignity to the weak and the wayward as he leveled the playing field. 
of power and wealth in ways they never could have imagined just a month before in Egypt. Are you powerful? Great. You'll be treated fair in court. Are you poor? Great. You'll be treated fair in court. So what should we talk about when we talk about this commandment? We could talk about plagiarism done by students on homework, and we could talk about pastors plagiarizing sermons. That's a thing sometimes. We could talk about how in the workplace, more generally, people take credit for someone else's good performance. We could talk about how we as Christians should be especially careful before jumping on some media bandwagon lest we be complicit in sharing about something that will prove false. We could talk about how someone, when they share something online that is incorrect and inflammatory, how that gets way more shares than the correction that follows up just a couple days later. We could talk about phishing scams, which is different than other kinds of phishing. This is spelled with a P. PH, which are lying scams to cheat people out of money. We could talk about truth in advertising. We could talk about a mechanic shop right down the road on 22. And I won't name which one, and there's dozens of them, actually, if you drive down 22, that told my wife the problem with the car was one thing. And then when I show up as the husband and ask, is that really the problem? All of a sudden, it's less of a problem and less expensive. Super shady. We could talk about betrayal in relationships. The sting of being lied to, it just hurts to be lied to. We could talk about the technical meanings of defamation, wrongly damaging one's character. When it happens in print, we call it libel. When it happens in speech, we call it slander. There's lots to talk about. And that's just to stay in the genre, so to speak, of lying. When talking about the ninth commandment, many authors and pastors, they start here on this commandment about lying, but then they branch out to other forms of speech and how we might tear others down with our words rather than building them up. And in this way, sermons about the ninth commandment become sermons about our speech more generally. And that's not a bad approach. It's a good approach, actually. But I want to do something different. Rather than branching out from this command about lying to talk about our speech more generally, I want to back up. Let's ask the question, why would someone bear false witness in a court of law? Think about that for a moment. What's going on in the human heart that would lead to bearing false witness? Why would someone lie? And here's my answer. We want to get our way more than God's way. You will lie when you want to get your way more than God's way. When you study this commandment about bearing false witness, there are a handful of Bible passages, three in particular, that keep bubbling up to the surface. So I want to just mention them to you briefly. You won't need to turn there. But first, there's this story of a man named Naboth. It's not a super well-known story, but Naboth has a vineyard. And the vineyard just so happens to be right next to the king's palace. And King Ahab offers to buy the land from Naboth, but Naboth says no. Having your land in the Old Testament was a big deal, and you didn't want to just sell it because that was your inheritance. And Ahab pouts about it. And his wife, Queen Jezebel, says essentially, don't pout, be happy, I'll get it for you. You read about this in 1 Kings chapter 21, where it says that Jezebel, quote, wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal, and she sent the letters to the elders and leaders who lived with Naboth in the city, and she wrote in the letters, proclaim a fast, And set Naboth at the head of the people, and set two worthless men opposite him, and let them bring a charge against him, saying, You've cursed God and king. Then take him out, Naboth, and stone him to death. And that's what they do. 
The witnesses lie about Naboth. He's stoned. Ahab takes the field. And God is furious with Ahab and Jezebel because they bore false witness to get what they wanted. You might say, well, that's a story of a bad king and a bad queen. About a better king, a good king like David, Bathsheba. 2 Samuel 11, we read that at the time that kings go out to war, David didn't. David stayed home, and when he saw Bathsheba, the wife of another man, he took her for himself. Then he lied to her husband Uriah and had Uriah killed in battle. Again, the story illustrates that when a heart wants something, it's willing to do things like lie to get it. And what I want to propose to you, it's not simply your virtue that keeps you from not lying. That's part of it. But it's also the fact that we don't think we can get away with it that keeps us from lying. i am just proposed to you speeding as an example. Right? How many of us are going to obey all the traffic signals at the same level of um, virtue when we know we don't have to? The third passage that comes up often when we talk about the ninth commandment is one with the religious leaders. The religious leaders. And Jesus, as they sought to kill him, we read in Mark 14 this. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. That's what they wanted. So what did they do? It says, they found many who bore false witness against him. Mark 14, 55 to 56 The religious leaders wanted Jesus dead, so they got people to say that he should be. So, in a way, as we're preaching a sermon about lying, right? I'm preaching a sermon about lying and truth-telling. But if in our sermon we're asking the question of why someone might lie, and we discover that behind our lying is the desire to get our way, then the sermon can't merely be about lying. The sermon must be about crucifying our pride. It's a sermon that confronts the way our hearts love to get our ways. And that's what each of these passages is showing us, that Naboth and Ahab and Jezebel, David and Bathsheba and Uriah, Jesus and the religious leaders, what we see is that lying grows out of hearts that want our way more than God's ways. If you've ever seen a toddler throw a tantrum, which I'm sure many of you have, then you know it's quite an event, a toddler's way or nothing. He's going to scream and yell and turn red in the face and lie and shout and make demands. As adults, we grow out of, or at least we tend to grow out of, these visible signs of a toddler's tantrums, but our hearts don't grow out of our nature. We need to be saved out of our nature, which is why we need Jesus. We may not be in the house of slavery as Egypt was, in that kind of slavery, but by our nature, the Bible says, we're just as enslaved. Your nature wants your way more than God's way. This is the truth that sets us free. Seeing our need for Jesus and seeing that we have him in the gospel. Some of you know that I enjoy professional cycling following professional cycling. And and most of you will be at least vaguely aware of the scandals around Lance Armstrong and really all of professional cycling during that era. For the longest time, Armstrong remained adamant of his innocence in cheating. We call it blood doping. There's other ways to cheat. Performance-enhancing drugs, PEDs. In cycling, it happens a little different than it did in baseball, but Armstrong was adamant about his innocence. And, and one of the early whistleblowers against Lance Armstrong was a guy named Floyd Landis, who incidentally just lives just 45 minutes. He grew up around here. Uh, and, and, and the knock on you know, he's sort of like this Amish farm boy. So he's got to be telling the truth. And it turns out, at least he was. He was a cheater, too. Um, He won the Tour de France, and they took his title away. But in that wake of that, he began accusing Armstrong, former teammate of Armstrong's, of cheating as well. And all of Armstrong's 
teammates just, just sang in harmony with Armstrong until they didn't. There was a guy named George Hincappy, one of Armstrong's chief lieutenants, most trusted teammates, one of the most respected men in cycling. And Hincappy sort of kept this lie going. He said, until guys showed up at his house with uniforms and guns and subpoenas talking about jail time. And that's when it, the lie just unraveled quite publicly, actually. And, and I'm not saying Hincapie became a Christian, but that moment does serve as sort of an illustration for us because of what it means to reckon with our sin and our need for Jesus. Either Hincapi could have maintained that lie into court and had it crumble there because it was going to crumble, or he could have let go of his pride, and he chose to let go of his pride. I say chose. Maybe we would say, though, he didn't choose to let down his pride, but he was forced to. This is why thinking about the ninth commandment makes me love Jesus so much. This way of thinking about the nine commandments helps me realize that these guys in uniforms coming with guns and subpoenas, we probably wouldn't say they love George Hincapie. Not in the way Jesus loves us anyway. I want to read to you from one of the gospel accounts. It's from Luke chapter 22 as Jesus is going into trial and he's got these false witnesses lying about him. But we also see Peter caught in one of the biggest lies of his life. Luke chapter 22, verse 60 through 62. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. Speaking to those around him. And immediately, while Peter was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord, we read, turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Jesus dies, comes back to life, and one of the first things he does is go to Peter and make a meal, and they eat together. Thinking about the ninth commandment and my own guilt really makes me love Jesus. Because I know I wouldn't love him if he hadn't first loved me. On my own, I could see scenarios that could take shape where I would maintain my own rightness until the moment I was exposed as a fool. I could tell you stories of seeing others caught in lies and how hard it is for them to admit they're wrong, but I could also tell you how hard it is for me when I'm caught to admit it, when I discipline too harshly, too much anger, too much of something else, how hard it is for me to repent to my children. When I speak too rashly in a workplace, knowing it's wrong, even at the moment I'm saying it, And yet think of a hundred reasons to justify why it was justifiable. Thinking about the ninth commandment and how much I love my own way really makes me love Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. When men bore false witness against him, he didn't argue in return, but he said, Father, forgive them. When his most outspoken lieutenant, a man named Peter, lied three times about even knowing Jesus, Jesus loved him and pursued him. When all the disciples fled away from Jesus at his crucifixion, Jesus, by staying the course, by being crucified, was in a sense pursuing them because he loves them. As he's pursuing us, 
If you're here this morning, it's because Jesus is pursuing you. If you don't know him, you can know him. And if you know Jesus, you can know him better. Because he wants to know you. And to know him is to know joy. To know forgiveness. To know life. As a closing passage, I want you to look with me at Acts chapter 1. So if you have that same Bible, turn to page 858. Acts chapter 1. Acts tells the story of the birth of the early church after the resurrection of Jesus. Page 855. Excuse me. Acts chapter 1. At first the disciples are asking Jesus as they see him resurrected about this time. When are you going to store the kingdom of Israel? Which is sort of a way to say, when are you going to take our earthly kingdom? When are you going to make our way great again? In a way, they're still the same types of disciples like you and I. Wanting their way and their kingdom. But Jesus gives them grace. He gives them forgiveness. Men who had lied about even knowing him. And he takes their eyes and he lifts them off of their earthly kingdom. Up to his own kingdom. Makes them truthful witnesses to the greater kingdom. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. So when they had come together, they, the disciples, asked him, Jesus, Lord, will at this time, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? To Israel, excuse me. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What a promise. Now may you and I become these types of witnesses, true witnesses, faithful witnesses, when power comes from on high to testify not to our own kingdom, but to the kingdom that will never end. Would you join me in prayer as we invite the worship team back up to lead us in one more song? Heavenly Father, we thank you that though our kingdoms are like little sparklers, that in our own way they will fizzle and fade. The kingdom of light will shine and shine and shine. Lord, I pray for those who are wrestling with truth. Lord, they they have words they need to say and they're hard to say. Lord, I pray for those who have words they need to hear, but they don't have ears to hear. Lord, I pray, as Ben was saying earlier, That as we leave, we would know not merely that you are a witness against us in the gospel and our sin, but that you are a witness for us on our behalf before the throne of God. That your life is interposed so that we can leave here forgiven and happy and restored. And as witnesses to the greater kingdom, would you make us that way this morning in Christ's name?